We continue our study through the fruit of the Spirit, and I invite you to look with me at Galatians 5.22 as we continue working through each of the fruit of the Spirit that are listed here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. We focus our attention today upon the fruit of goodness. And then from the Gospels, Matthew chapter 19, verse 17, We read, then Jesus answered and said, I'm sorry, it's in the wrong chapter, 1917, and he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. <clears throat> There was once a time in our history in which a good man and a good woman was highly esteemed. But now the definition of good and of goodness has been so completely hijacked by a worldly, self-centered culture that almost everyone within this culture considers themselves to be a good person. But I'm reminded of what Solomon says in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. To most people, dear ones, a good person is usually conceived as being one who simply does not hurt someone else or as someone who has not committed a really really big sin someone who does not perform satanic sacrifices someone who does not commit a mass murder someone who does not terrorize with bombs someone who does not rob banks and if you survey and then simply ask the question in talking with people, do you think that you're a good person? You'll find, I believe, that most people in our culture believe that they are a good person. They believe that they do more good things than they do bad things, or they don't do as bad of things as someone else does because most people believe they are good or mostly good most people have deluded themselves into believing that a good god will surely usher in good people like themselves into heaven at death rather than casting them into hell if they even believe in hell whereas the bible teaches dear ones that God alone is perfectly good as to his very nature and can only do that which is good and that no mere human being upon earth does what is good by nature. For Paul says in Romans 3.12, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. The worldly skeptics of this, wor of this age proudly and foolishly invert and assert that man is good and that God is not good if he permits the pain and the suffering in this world to continue when he could stop it. Perhaps there is not a fruit of the Spirit that is more misunderstood 
than the fruit of goodness. And I dare say that we will not understand, let alone grow in the fruit of goodness, unless we put aside our own childish wisdom and bow prostrate before the wisdom of God revealed to us in Holy Scripture. <clears throat> Do you remember Job? He challenged the believer. He challenged the goodness and wisdom of God in ordaining the pain and the suffering that he endured. But God revealed to Job his pride and his ignorance with the outcome that Job confessed the audacity of his foolishness in challenging the infinitely sovereign, infinitely good, and infinitely wise God. In Job chapter 42, which we would do well to heed and to hear as we begin talking about the goodness of of God and that goodness which God gives to his people. Job 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Job claims the sovereignty of God over all. And then he continues, who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. You see, that's the place that each of us must be brought. To understand that God is absolutely sovereign, and yet God is absolutely good. There is not a compromise of one or the other in the nature and in the acts of God, as we will see in the sermons to come. And dear ones, that is the heart alone that will be taught and will learn the good treasures of the Lord's wisdom when we fall prostrate before the Lord and learn of him and not import our own worldly ideas into what the goodness of God is, but allow God to tell us what the goodness of God is. The main points for the sermon this Lord's Day are the following. First of all, what is goodness? Galatians 5.22. And second, what is the goodness of God? From Matthew 19, verse 17. So our first main point, what is goodness? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Goodness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of goodness, dear ones, is often viewed as a twin fruit together with the fruit of gentleness or as gentleness is also translated in other places in the New Testament as kindness. And that fruit we have previously considered, just previously considered. And though the concepts and the applications of the fruit of gentleness and the fruit of goodness may overlap at various times, at various points, in various applications, the Holy Spirit has listed the fruit of gentleness and the fruit of goodness as being two distinct fruits of the Spirit. So let us consider 
briefly some distinctions between the fruit of goodness and the fruit of gentleness. First, I submit to you that the fruit of goodness is broader and more comprehensive in its scope than is gentleness. In fact, it might be said that goodness encompasses gentleness. A child of God through faith alone in Christ alone manifests the fruit of gentleness because he or she is good by the gift of God's grace. For example, when the Lord tells Moses that he, that is God, will manifest to Moses his glory there upon Mount Sinai, God describes his glory manifested to Moses as a manifestation of all my goodness. All my goodness. The word there in the Old Testament, tov, is used in Exodus 33, verse 19. And what attributes of God are included in God's goodness? Well, according to Exodus 34, 6, God mentions that these are the attributes of goodness. Mercy, grace, long-suffering. Then it mentions the word goodness, but that is not the same word in the Hebrew as tov, when God said he would show all his goodness. This is a word that is actually the word translated in other places as loving kindness, or we might say gentleness of God. It's the Hebrew word kesed. And then also God says that his truth is comprehended under his goodness as well, his trustworthiness to keep his promises. So first of all, let's note that goodness is a very comprehensive term under which are many of the other attributes of God. Second, whereas gentleness refers to kindness and refers to mildness rather than to harshness shown to others, even to those who provoke us, as we've noted, goodness refers to primarily two complementary ideas. First, goodness in scripture refers to moral goodness. And second, goodness in scripture refers to generous goodness. I'll talk about each of those right now. I'll just explain a little far, uh, further what I mean. When the scripture speaks of goodness as referring to moral goodness, it refers to God's, or refers to whether it's referring to God as to his goodness or to man as to man's goodness, it's talking about integrity. It's talking about uprightness of character. As when we speak of a, a good man as opposed to an evil man, for example, in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 2, notice the contrast here that Solomon makes. A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. Notice the contrast between a good man and a wicked man. Or another type of contrast between good works, when we're speaking of moral goodness, good works as opposed to evil works. For example, in John chapter 5, verse 29, it speaks of those who will be raised upon the last day, those who have done good works to a resurrection of life, those who have done evil works to a resurrection of death and, and condemnation. So again, this contrast between good and evil, that's the first 
idea communicated by goodness, moral goodness. And when we see, for example, God himself referred to as good in Psalm 25, verse 8. Notice, it's talking about God being morally good. <clears throat> good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. Good and upright, used by way of parallel, that the good God is an upright God. But also, there is another nuance, as we've just mentioned, to goodness. And it refers to generous goodness or bountiful goodness in benefiting or supplying others with what is useful or what is needful in their lives. As when we speak of one who gives out of the goodness of his heart, out of the generosity of his heart, in other words, not begrudgingly. This is the second idea communicated by goodness, that of generosity. And in Luke 6.35, the Lord Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount speaks of our duty as those who are good by the grace, by the power of God, how are we to treat others? Well, we find in Luke 6, 35, but love ye your enemies and do good and lend. Out of the generosity of your heart, be good and lend, hoping for nothing again and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the thank, unthankful and to the evil. That is, God himself is kind. God himself is good. We are simply mirroring and reflecting the goodness of God as we bestow upon others out of the bounty of our own hearts, the generosity of our own hearts, and give to others. Likewise, we read concerning the Lord God himself in this respect of the generous and bountiful heart of God in Psalm 107, verses 8 through 9. <clears throat> oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. And so this idea of generosity, likewise being a, another nuance to the word goodness. Third, with regard to what is goodness, and before moving to our next main point, I must emphasize, contrary to the notions and worldly wisdom of this, of this age in which we live, the following about the biblical concept of goodness. Dear ones, goodness is not simply, as noted in the introduction, is not simply avoiding certain bad habits, certain bad things but is positively manifested in doing that which pleases God. Goodness is manifested in that which pleases God. Out of faith in Christ and love to Christ, in accordance with his will found in Scripture and to the supreme glory of God. Now, that's a brief definition of what a good work is, and we're going to be talking about what are good works in a future sermon as we talk about the fruit of goodness. Because, dear ones, no unregenerate person 
can do or even desires to do that kind of a good work as just defined, it confirms what scripture teaches about man apart from Christ as Paul lays out so clearly in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, about the nature of man. Is this, is this a description of a good man? Listen closely. This is what Paul says is true of us all by nature, not by grace, not by God's grace, but by nature that we have inherited from Adam. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So much for the alleged goodness of natural man. Jones, we cannot be good as God defines good until we truly recognize and confess that we are not good by nature. In fact, that we are ungodly and wicked by nature. You see, the first step, the very first step to become a good man or a good woman or a good child is to confess that God alone is truly good. And apart from his goodness, no man or woman or child can become good. For beloved God, God does not justify and declare those righteous who are good according to his word but he declares righteous. He justifies and declares righteous those who are ungodly, according to Romans 4, verse 5. Those who know themselves to be ungodly in their nature, not good within their nature. Christ did not come to save, dear ones, the good. He came to save sinners. That is those who know themselves to be sinners, according to Matthew 9, 13. Thus, dear ones, doing certain good things to others does not make you or me a good person. For true goodness comes from God alone. There is, dear ones, no self-help program there is no 12-step program to make a person good. One is not born with a temperament of biblical goodness. It is not a personality trait. It is a gift of God and fruit of the sovereign and good spirit of God. There is certainly a sinful reflection of this goodness within men. And that's the, the only reason that we do not destroy by nature one another, that God has allowed even that goodness, which was present in the Garden of Eden in which he created Adam and Eve, Though they lost that original righteousness, there is yet a faint glimmer of that right of that goodness so that man it's not certainly anything that man that will justify man because it falls so far short of god's goodness and god's glory but it is indeed something that we see yet that tells us that man once was in fullness good but lost that goodness and is responsible for having lost that goodness and now there is only goodness, that true goodness found in Jesus Christ. 
And dear ones, this fruit of goodness is indeed implanted in the heart of every Christian at his or her regeneration without exception. So that every Christian has in respect to the fruit of the spirit, in respect to the fruit of goodness, has the DNA of Jesus Christ as we continue to remind you. It is an attribute of God, goodness. It is an attribute, a character, a part of the character of Jesus Christ. And that is implanted in the Christian. There was the goodness of God, both the moral goodness and the generous goodness of God. It's just another one of the family resemblances that the Spirit of God is growing in the life of every child of God. We're at varying degrees of that growth of goodness in our lives, but in every Christian's life, the fruit of goodness is growing. It must be because again, it is the DNA. It's the life of Jesus Christ within us. And therefore we pray, we call out to the Lord, Lord produce more and more of thy goodness, the fruit which thou hast implanted in my life, cause it to grow more and more every day. Both in its moral character, moral goodness, and in its generosity and bountifulness and generous goodness in both nuances of goodness. We come now to the second main point what is the goodness of God? Once again, in, in our text, Matthew chapter 19, verse 17, we read, And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Because the quality of being good or the concept of goodness must be directly and uh, or re originally tracked back to God himself who alone is perfectly and originally good, we will focus our attention upon the goodness of God for the remainder of this sermon and in, I think, even sermons to come, uh, we'll be considering more about the goodness of God. But we'll be uh, touching the surface in this particular sermon on the goodness of God. Our text here in Matthew 19, verse 17, narrates uh, the historical account of a man uh, whom Luke calls a certain ruler in Luke 18:18, 18, 18, uh, who is said according to Mark's gospel in Mark 10:17 to have run to Christ and to have cast himself before Christ, knelt before Christ out of honor for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we ask ourselves, why was he running? What was so urgent, especially for a nobleman, someone who was a rich nobleman, a rich uh, ruler? What was so urgent? Why all the hurry to meet Christ? Well, he had a question of eternal consequence that was weighing very, very heavily upon his heart. Would to God that there were more who had that same heavy heartedness about the question of their eternal soul. But his question is framed this way in Matthew 9, 16, the previous verse, 19, 16. Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, he was not asking the right question, but he did have a concern for the state of his soul. 
this Jewish ruler imagined that eternal life would be secured by his good works. What good thing must I do? He believed that it was due to his obedience to the law of God that would secure eternal life for him. But Jesus ultimately demonstrates to him that no one can gain eternal life by good works or keeping God's law because all people except Jesus himself fail to keep God's law perfectly just as did this sincere ruler of the Jews who was rich and had made his wealth his own God and would therefore not obey Christ and his commandment when God when Christ specifically told him to go and sell all that he had and then to follow him. You see, the Lord Jesus nailed him on what commandment of God he did not keep, even though he said he kept all the commandments of God. And so it is true with anybody who says, oh, I've kept the commandments of God. No, they haven't. Everyone has broken God's commandments except Jesus Christ. And since God, as a righteous judge, does not grade on a curve or weigh one's good works against one's wicked works, and the good works outweigh the wicked works, then he's in. If the wicked works outweigh the good works, then he's doomed to hell. No, God doesn't grade on a curve, nor does he weigh all that in the scales. All people, because they have not perfectly according to his righteous standards of goodness, been good, all people by nature deserve the eternal, everlasting condemnation of God. And the Lord Jesus brought this rich ruler to see that eternal life comes not from good works, which do not meet the standard of God's goodness, that come from the good works of Jesus Christ, who is the good shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep. Yes, good works will follow those who come to Jesus Christ. They will, they will seek by God's grace to walk in the fruit of goodness. But good works are not the source or the grounds for their justification and acceptance before God. As urgent and necessary as that truth is, that our good works cannot save us, that is only the good works of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, his obedience to God's law, his righteousness as imputed to us, as important and essential and necessary as that truth is, I want to emphasize another truth about this text. And it is the truth that Jesus Christ declares that, quote, there is none good but one, that is God. In Matthew 19, 17. You see, the rich Jewish ruler had called Jesus in Matthew 19, 16, had called him good master. Now Jesus uses the words of the Jewish ruler to infer that he, Jesus, is the one true and good God. For Christ states the unequivocal truth that only God is truly good. How can you call me good? Only God is good. Therefore, if you call me good and God is only good, I am the good God. You see, dear ones, this is a powerful inferential argument from the lips of Christ to demonstrate Christ's deity. But dear ones, don't miss this truth. That is also clear, it is a clear declaration from the lips of Jesus Christ that God alone is truly good. As to his nature, 
and as to all his acts and works which he performs in creation providence and redemption thus let the skeptics hurl their foolish arguments against the goodness of god in all that he is and in all that he does they're all liars for there is none good but one that is god the lord we read in psalm 2 the lord laughs at them and holds them in derision and will bring his good and righteous judgment upon all the unbelieving and the unrepentant his good and righteous judgment i would now like to further unpack very briefly the attribute of god's goodness the scripture does not set up some kind of apologetical argument to defend the infinite goodness of god it simply declares that god is good anymore then scripture gives us a step-by-step -step defense of the existence of god scripture simply begins in genesis 1 1 in the beginning god so likewise the goodness of God is clearly placed before us to admire from the very beginning of creation so that we might worship the Lord God who is good and to worship him for his goodness. In Genesis 1.31, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Beloved, if you want to know why God blesses this world and mankind with material and spiritual blessings in creation, providence, and redemption, it is because he is good. He is good. That's the foundation of those blessings. God's goodness. Listen to the words of the psalmist. In Psalm 145, verses 9 through 10. The Lord is good, not to some. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies are over, not some of his works, all of his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord and thy saints shall bless thee. In Matthew chapter 5, once again in the Sermon on the Mount, we read concerning God and ascending rain and sunshine upon the, the just and the unjust, the good and the evil. Matthew 5.45, notice what it says about the goodness of God. <clears throat> I'll begin with verse 44. <clears throat> but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Notice verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. In, a, in other words, we are to be like our heavenly father who is good. We're to imitate him. And then it says, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts 10, 38, that he went, around, uh, went throughout the land doing good, doing good. That's what characterized the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry. He went around doing good, doing good. As one of God's attributes, God's goodness is infinite. That is, God's goodness knows no boundaries. 
God's goodness is morally perfect without the least stain of unrighteousness. God's goodness is eternal. Where you see God well, it is from all eternity to eternity. And he has never been anything but good because God's goodness is immutable. That is, God never changes. God's goodness, therefore, never changes. God is always in his nature, in all of his purposes, in all of his acts, absolutely and unfailingly good. Even when he judges. Even in the suffering, the wars, the pestilences, the famines, the natural calamities, in the murder that occurs within the world, God never ceases to be good in his sovereign ordination and control of all such miseries and judgments within the world. In other words, the goodness of God never changes. It never increases and it never decreases. Perhaps what the world finds so objectionable about the good God of the Bible, which is God's own revelation of himself, is that he does not, he does not exist to give to the world whatever they want. He is not some celestial Santa Claus. The worldly view of good is determined by what pleases the world. Whereas the biblical view of good is determined by what pleases God as revealed in God's holy commandments and in the gospel of Jesus Christ. No wonder the world talks about God not being good. They do not understand the goodness of God. Of course, they can't talk uh, rationally about the goodness of God because they won't believe what God has revealed about himself. It's found in the Holy Scripture. The good God of the Bible, first and foremost, dear ones, glorifies himself and exhibits his goodness in the world for his own glory, without apology and without the counsel from any other creature. Romans eleven thirty four 34 says, who hath been his, that is God's counselor. The skeptics, the, the so-called wise of this world, who do they think they are? It's like what we were reading in Job and how God says, Job, you think you can challenge my goodness, my wisdom? Where were you when this occurred? Where were you when I created this? Where were you? Where were you? And so God says to all the skeptics of this age who attack the goodness of God, where were you? Who has been God's counselors? Certainly not these skeptics. The worldly wisdom of man, dear ones, foolishly states that God cannot be sovereign and good at the same time because they do not understand Again, the goodness of God. They reason if he is good, that is, if God is good, then he cannot be sovereign because a good God who is sovereign would not allow all of the evil to go on that occurs within the world, but would intervene, would prevent it. And in a sermon to come, we shall see that God is indeed both sovereign and good and that he ordains and controls all things to bring about the good ends that he has eternally, everlastingly purposed. According to Ephesians 1.11, speaking of God who worketh 
all things, not some things, all things after the counsel of his will. And according to Romans 8, 28, works all things together for the good, for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Beloved, the world and unfortunately many who profess to be Christians want a Santa Claus for their God. They don't want the God who reveals himself as both sovereign and good in all that he does. That's revealed in the scriptures. But dear ones, the good God has given his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. However, the world does not want this most precious gift of a good God. It hates this good gift of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and will not submit to him, will not receive that gift of God's goodness. And yet the world, nevertheless, the world is bathed moment by moment in the goodness of God, by way of the sunshine, by way of the rain, by way of uh, a roof over one's head, by way of food, by way of shelter, by way of clothing, by way of many things, by way of every breath that one takes. Even though they continue, even though the world continues to speak against God, to hate and to despise him. The world calls God's goodness and generosity. They rob God of his glory. They call God's goodness and generosity their own works. They call God's goodness to them their own accomplishments, their own possessions, their own gifts, their own wealth, and their own knowledge. And on and on it goes. They rob God of the glory of his goodness, which he has bestowed upon mankind in so many ways. And yet the Lord continues to send rain and sunshine and other material benefits, despite the sin and rebellion of this world. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, the best gift is proclaimed even to the undeserving to come unto Christ. To receive him but the good God dear ones will one day this good God will one day issue forth his good judgment upon those who denied his goodness rejected his goodness and abused his goodness for their own pleasure in unbelief dear ones we need never apologize for God's goodness displayed in creation, providence, whether in providence it is the miseries of this life, the judgments of God in this life, or the eternal sufferings of hell. We need never apologize for God's goodness displayed in redemption in salvation, whether the election of sinners chosen in Christ Jesus before the uh, world began, or the reprobation of sinners not chosen in Christ Jesus before the world began. God is good in who he is and in all that he does in creation, providence, and redemption. Never forget that the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible delights in his goodness to you, his dear children, whom he has purchased by the precious blood of his own dear son. God gives, dear ones, 
to you out of his goodness with joy and gladness, not begrudgingly. He delights to give to you his children. He rejoices in it. In Psalm 104, verse 31, notice the words that are spoken in this regard. <clears throat> The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. The Lord would not bestow his bounty and his gifts to men, and particularly the gift of his son, if he did not delight in his own goodness, take joy in his own goodness. The goodness of God, in fact, beloved, or even one who has not become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, the goodness of God is your warrant to come to Christ today, to receive him by faith or to plead as a child of God your need before him. The goodness of God is your warrant to come to Christ today. If there is no goodness, of God, there would be, dear ones, no salvation through Christ or no hope in this world at all. In fact, there wouldn't be no creation. There would be no providence. Everything would be chaos in this world, total chaos. It would fall apart as to its actual substance because it's by God's good providence that he upholds everything that he has made and even restrains by his goodness the evil of man that would destroy all mankind. There was, there is no merit at all in your works, your faith or your repentance. All of the merit is in Christ and his good work of salvation. God withheld not even his only begotten son in bestowing the goodness of salvation upon undeserving sinners chosen in Christ Jesus before the world began. And if in God's goodness he withheld not his only begotten son to save you, will he withhold any good gift from you in order to sanctify you? According to Luke chapter 11, verse 13, we read there in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus speaking with regard to the goodness of the Father. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And Matthew's gospel says, give to them what is good those who ask him to give that which is good to those who ask him but he sends you dear ones <clears throat> in your life maybe in your opinion more like a thorn in the flesh not the goodness of god it may not be what you even asked him to send but I ask you, do you trust in his goodness, whether it be life or death, whether it be misery or blessing? Do you trust in his goodness that he can only give you that which is good as his dear child? Whatever the grace you need, whatever the fruit of the spirit that is in need of growth in your life, your good shepherd, is not wearied by your many solicitations and pleadings with him. He is pleased at all times, always to give you what is good. Without exception, to give you what is good, even when he withholds from you what you have specifically asked because you thought that was what was good for you. The Lord God, who is good, 
never gives what is not good to his children, but only gives that which is good. According to what we read in Luke 11 and in Matthew 5 concerning the Father. Are you willing to rest in the goodness of God no matter what trial, tribulation, or suffering assails you? Herein, dear child of God, is your only place of comfort and rest. Your good God and Savior has ordained it. Whether prosperity or poverty, whether healing or illness, whether success or failure, he himself, the good God who has saved you, has ordained it for your good. For your good. And I close. Genesis chapter 50. Verse 20. We're at the end. Of, of, of this particular book. Of the Bible. Speaking of Joseph. After his brothers had wickedly sold him into slavery. After Joseph, as a result of being sold into slavery, had been sold into the house of the chief captain of the guard, and, and his wife had lied uh, about him so that he was cast into prison, prison for many years. At the end, as his brothers who had sold him into slavery and put him through all that trial and that agony, as their father Jacob had now died, they are trembling and shaking. What will Joseph do now to us? That our father is no longer alive to defend us. And Joseph's words to his brothers, struggling with their own fear, recognizing that what they did was evil. The words of Joseph, are these but as for you speaking to his brothers as for you ye thought evil against me in other words you intended this evil for me you even lied that about me having been sent into slavery and you said that I had been slain by a wild animal and caused my father, such grief and agony. You are responsible for the evil that you did. But God meant it unto good. You meant it for evil, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive because Joseph had been sent into Egypt and by God's providence brought to become second in command. And because he had interpreted Pharaoh's dream of seven, first of all, seven years of prosperity and then seven years of famine and because God gave Joseph the wisdom to prepare for the seven bad years of famine. It was because of that, that Jacob sent his sons into Egypt to solicit to pay for food for their family, with, the, with eventually Joseph revealing who he was to his brothers. And Jacob and all of the family being brought to Egypt to be rescued and saved. And from that family because that family was preserved came the lord jesus christ came the lord jesus christ you meant it for evil god meant it for good many people may mean evil towards you whatever the evil that others mean the ones god means it intends it for your good because he's a good god cast yourselves today upon the goodness of God. Believe it. And the Lord will sustain and uphold you. Amen.